explore. Okay, so that that focus uh, was really on identification, a little inter introduction to the UCIPM webpage and resources because those are going to be key uh, tools for you in identifying pets. So, so along with identification, of course, key elements of integrated pest management are, are the ecological approach, preventing problems, combining different types of management methods, which might include good cultural practices, biological control, mechanical, physical control, and integrated pest management programs do include pesticides in some cases, but only when they're necessary and as the last resort. If you do use pesticides, uh, use the least toxic pesticide that will be effective. And so this whole IPM program is going to protect the people and the environment. Um, so let's sort of look at uh, uh, pest control through the ages here. So back in the, the bad old days, before integrated pest management, um, here we have a problem. Somebody has found a few ants walking along their stoop. And they've done the logical thing, which is to go out and buy a canarade and spray them. And boy, does that feel good. You spray them, and then you got a bunch of dead ants, and you think, like, you've accomplished something today. But the fact is, in a few days, you know, you're going to have another 10,000 ants walking through there. And so that is not a solution of not a long-term prevention solution, no matter how satisfying it may be. It's not going to solve your ant problem. Uh, so in integrated pest management, we want to figure out why the, your home or landscape has got a problem, and if it really is a problem, and how you can change the environment to fix it. So for instance, if you see ants crawling outside of your house or inside of your house, in fact, if if you just have ants crawling around outside of your house, they're not inside your house, they're probably not really a pest that you really need to be concerned about managing unless they're getting into plants which have honeydew producers like aphids, soft scales, mealybugs, and white flies because they do protect those insects from their natural enemies. But outside, uh, many times ants are being, doing beneficial things. They're aerating the soil, they're feeding on termites, they are feeding on other pests. But when ants get inside our house, then they really are pests because they, they bother people. We want to manage them. So one of the important things is to focus on a goal which is reasonable and realistic um, uh, rather than eradicating ants off the face of the earth <laughs> or off your entire acre. So here we, they, they've got ants going in the house and they've found a little crack here um, where the ants are probably going, coming in from. And so what do you do? Get that can of rain? And fill the crack. No, you get a little caulking gun and you fill the crack, as somebody said. So that is a more permanent solution because then the ants can't come in. Yeah? Um, I heard a statistic once that if you weighed all the ants on the planet Earth and you weighed all the human beings, the ants would outweigh the human beings. Do you know if that's true? I have no idea. <laughs> <laughs> it was a pretty reliable source. <laughs> I don't know how they no. put it in that. <laughs> yeah. But there certainly are more of them than us, so keep that in mind. <laughs> Um, as you're stomping on them, you know, like only get to the tip of the iceberg because behind every ant um, that you see in your house, there's a whole colony of 100,000 uh, that can come in the next day. So you, you want to go around your house and figure out where the ants might be coming in, um, do a little inspection. Uh, uh, sometimes what happens is um, you'll have a tree branch coming on and, and the ants will be able to crawl on the tree, so you may want to lock that tree off. So try to get seal up your house so the ants can't get in. That's a much more preventive and long-term solution. And if you continue to have ant problems, you may uh, inside your house, you may want to look around the perimeter of your house and see what if you are providing uh, a good habitat uh, that the, encourages the ants to be there. So. 
the Argentine ant, which is one of the very most common ants that are problems inside houses in California, it, it likes to nest in uh, wood debris, wood piles, it likes moisture, it requires moisture. Uh, and so if you've got a, a mulch and sprinklers going around the foundation of your house, then you're providing an ideal nesting environment for these Argentine ants. And if you have something like roses or something there that maybe have a lot of aphids that are producing sugary honeydew, which provides food for the ants, you have provided a wonderful environment for a colony of ants. You have done it. And who can, if they're just nesting here in this wonderful environment you've provided for them, who can blame them for going in your house, which is just there, and see, you know, what kind of pictures you have on the wall. <laughs> so, if you, you think about the environment, now, if you don't have, if you have mold against the wall and you don't have any ant problems, don't worry about it. But if you have persistent problems, you're going to want to change the environment. You may want to remove uh, trees that have food sources for uh, ants that are very close to the house as well. Uh, and certainly, irrigation, uh, irrigated mulch along the edge of the house is a real, um, uh, a real ant uh, attractor. And then when the ants come in your house, they actually aren't there looking for, uh, looking at your artwork. They're there looking for food. Ants are very, or water. These are very thirsty ants, so they will, they like to go. Sometimes you'll find them under your sink where you have a leaky sink or somewhere else where they're, they're getting water. Or food, they like sugary food. So, you know, you may have a recycling bin with a little Coke and there's sugary drinks in the, the cans. Um, or a dog or cat food dish there where they get food, the garbage or other things. See, so you, you want to get rid of the food sources that they like because if they come in your house and they don't find anything to eat and they don't find anything to drink, they probably, after a few days, are probably not going to come back. But if they do find something that's good, they're going to go back to their colony and bring 10,000 of their, their family in to, to collect the food. So you, you have to have that. In general, um, you can wipe up the ants with soapy water um, over those few days while they're finding out that there's nothing in your house for them to eat, and that may solve the problem. Um, if, but you may have a more serious problem, in which case you may need to use ant baits this is an ant bait dispenser for really big problems, but yeah. you can start off with those those little uh, you know, uh, ant bait, boric acid, taro kinds of things uh, for small problems, and that may solve the problem. The, the idea behind ant baits is that the ants, so what ants are doing when they're off there uh, in your recycling bin, taking the sugary drinks there, taking little droplets of that, or the honey, or the grease, and they're taking it back to their colony, and usually the colony is outside, in the, in the ground, and so they're feeding their larvae and their queens, and so they're carrying the food back. And so the idea behind ant baits is you have a sugary substance um, that's laced with an insecticide, so they carry that back to their colony, and they feed their colony the pesticide. And so they're actually killing their, their colony. Um, but the trick behind that is you can't have a pesticide that, that kills them before they can get it back to the colony. So they have to be slow-acting pesticides and baits. And one of the problems you find with some bait products is they kill the ants right away and they can't get it back to the colony. But if you don't have a severe problem, that suck. And that's with those little ant baits, which are um, 5% uh, borate. But if you have a more severe problem, you need to use uh, more complicated methods, like these outdoor uh, bait stations. Uh, the thing that we're trying to uh, get people away from is uh, perimeter sprays of uh, pesticides like uh, 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 the, the various kinds of uh, pesticides that get into water and are causing big water quality problems, the pyrethroids, um, the organophosphates aren't used very much. Um, these perimeter treatments, and often people have somebody coming in uh, a few times a year just to do this as a prophylactic. And uh, 
that's not good because the pesticide washes into the into the uh, uh, into the waterways. Now, new regulations have been imposed on pest control operators who do this so that they are not able to, they're using different kinds of products and in a different way, so it's, it's not uh, as serious water quality problems as it used to be. But that, we are trying to encourage people to use the more integrated approach, which includes making the environment less favorable for the ants, using the bait stations, um, and sealing up the home, and then you can avoid or really reduce these kinds of sprays to when you really have a problem. Uh, there's more information. Ants are the complicated pest to manage. There's more information and videos of how to use these kinds of bait stations on the website. Um, at the ant pest note, can take a look at those. So in the integrated pest management course, the, the first thing that you want to do is prevent pests um, in the first place. One thing is to build them out through your structures, like building ant-proof structures, building mouse or rat-proof structures. Those would be ways to prevent problems. Another way to prevent problems is choosing pest-resistant plants or plants that don't have pest problems. There's many of them out there. and you, you, the best way to find out about them is to uh, ask your local nursery or, or other master gardeners about plants that grow well and don't seem to have pest problems in, in your area. Uh, many times native plants uh, will have fewer pest problems, but uh, not always, depending on when they're growing. Cultural controls are really good gardening practices that are making your garden more <coughs> Uh, resistant or tolerant of pests or less likely to have t pests move in. So these are things that you would generally do anyway, but you might do them in a slightly different way to reduce pest problems. And there's tons of different ways. One is site selection. So when you're choosing where to uh, uh, locate or plant a plant, choose a site where it will do well. Uh, don't plant a plant that has very susceptible to root problems in a, in a waterlogged area. Um, plant uh, plants that, um, some plants will have more severe pest problems when they're grown in the shade rather than the sun. Um, uh, notice that with the greenhouse thrips, uh, seems to have fewer problems in sunny locations than, than, than shady locations. Um, have sanitation really re uh, means removing sources of pests. So uh, when you have weedy areas, for instance, around your garden and those weeds may be blowing in, get the, don't let them go to seed and, and get them out of there. Sanitation uh, uh, is important for things like cockroach control. You don't want to have um, food sources there for them. Uh, sanitation could be important for pests of many fruits, like codling moth uh, and apples, the, the uh, and navel orangeworm, and uh, various nut crops. The, the caterpillars will overwinter in the culls that are left on the trees uh, over the winter time. If you can get all those culls out of the garden, then you're not going to have a source of the pest problems. So there's many different ways of just making sure. Uh, you don't, often you'll have a lot of aphids on your cabbages or something. You, you want to get all those aphid infested culls out of there before you plant again or as soon as possible. Habitat modification means making an environment, changing the environment so the pest doesn't thrive as well. Uh, one thing you might think about roof rats, for instance. Roof rats uh, can be a very difficult problem to manage if you've got. They, they usually are associated with thick vegetation, often growing up the side of the house or up a tree that's near a house, or thick tree, bushy vegetation near the house. And those roof rats um, just they nest there and they get in the house. And they're very hard to manage, even with traps or toxic baits. But if you can get rid of those nesting sites, and also probably their food sources that might be garbage bins nearby, for instance, then that's how you will manage uh, the best way to manage those roof rats because often the traps and the toxic baits won't work anyway. But if you remove their shelter, 
and their food, that is their habitat has been destroyed and they'll, they'll move out of there. So, you know, we talked about that with earwigs. Remove the habitat where they like the hiding places and the moisture, uh, then they can't thrive. So that's why when you, you want to identify the pests and then you want to learn a little bit about the biology so you can figure out what is it in my garden that's helping this particular pest thrive. Water management is very important. We probably kill more plants with water management than any, with bad water management than any other <laughs> way. Part of, sometimes it's drought, but many times it's also over watering. And fertilizing. People love to fertilize their plants, but a lot of plants don't need as much fertilizer as people put on them. Um, many up in Northern California, and I may be true here also, um, uh, trees that are just grown not for flowers or fruit, but ornamental trees generally do not need to be fertilized at all because we have enough natural uh, nu nutrients in the soil. When you add fertilizer, what happens to your plants? Fertilizer, a lot of water? They just they grow. <laughs> well, of course, you want them to grow, but they grow this lush vegetative growth. And what likes lush vegetative growth? Bugs, yeah. Aphids, all kinds of sucking insects. Uh, aphids, lace bugs, they will just thrive on this. So you can actually manufacture your own little outbreak of um, some of these sucking insects by uh, pruning it back, adding a lot of fertilizer and water, and they get this flush of growth and you'll get lots of aphids. And, the lady beetles being very happy. <laughs> but um, fertilizer, we do have a tendency to over fertilize. Now, fruit trees need fertilizer, but not too much. Like they've shown in peaches, if you put too much fertilizer on your peaches, then um, you will increase your problems with the peach twig borer, which is an insect. You can increase your problem with uh, uh, brown rot, which is a, a, a pathogen. You just want to put enough, but not too much. And then flowers like uh, roses and flowering plants will have more flowers if you fertilize. But watch it. Don't overdo it. You can burn. You can certainly burn your plants with fertilizer. And of course, that's very common on lawns, is, is to see fertilizer burn on lawns. Uh, so good cultural practices are important for uh, lawn management fertilizing properly, irrigating properly, mowing at the proper height. If you if you mow your grass too low, if you are trying to do a, a putting green, then the, the grass doesn't, it, it's not competitive with weeds. It, it can't take stress from, from other factors. You want to mow it at the right ha height. And it, it varies from uh, grass species too. Uh, pruning, again, if you prune improperly, you can let in uh, boring insects, wood decay, fungi, you can make your trees look ugly. So again, this is a cultural practice that you want to do it right. Um, and there are many other cultural practices, really. Every time you do something in your garden, think about how it can impact pest problems. So physical and mechanical controls, again, this is a whole variety of types of things that you do to physically or mechanically uh, control pests. Um, anything from stomping on the cockroach, uh, to putting screens on your houses. Uh, you can also uh, put uh, screens over your growing plants or, or little plant cups to keep seedling pests out. Um, uh, <coughs> there's traps. This is, a, uh, this is a gopher trap here. Um, are used uh, for vertebrate pests a lot. is probably the most common tool other than habitat management that you can use against um, uh, rodents. Um, but there are also traps that are used for, we do use traps like we talked about, the earwig newspaper roll. For snails and slugs, you can use traps. There's those yellow sticky traps that are used sometimes for white flies and, and aphids. Um, and then there's um, pheromone traps that are used mostly for monitoring uh, <coughs> uh, certain kinds of insects. So there are a number of uh, traps that are used for insect pests as well. Uh, mowing, flaming, mulches. Mulches are 
really the key way of managing weeds in landscapes and gardens other than pulling the weeds out. So mulches are very important. And they are, of course, a physical and mechanical control because they're depriving the weeds of, of light. So that's a physical thing. Solarization is when you put uh, clear plastic on um, in the warm time of the year, uh, clear plastic on bare soil, moist soil, um, and this is for about six weeks. And this will cook the soil, uh, raise the temperature in the soil for about 12 inches there, and will kill most weed seeds, most plant pathogens, most nematodes. And so it's a very effective way of controlling many of these pests in the, the top 12 inches of the soil. Uh, and so that's, of course, a physical control because it's heating up the soil. Um, various kinds of barriers are, are used, copper barriers for snails and slugs. Um, so there are many kinds of physical and mechanical controls. Uh, once you understand the life cycle of your pest, then you may be able to figure out some way of doing it. And, and again, I'm not giving specific, but once you identify your pest, these books, or the pest notes will identify specific cultural, physical, and biological controls that work for each pest. Because one size doesn't fit all. Um, that's one of the reasons it's, it's, a, it's a broad subject area. A cultural control that works against one pest is not going to work against another. So you've you, you got to go from there. Right. Was there a question? Yes. What is, I must have missed it, what is flaming? Flaming, oh yeah, flaming is weed control. You can buy a flamer uh, and it, uh, uh, you can flame, flame the weed control. The thing about flamers is um, you've got to be careful that you don't light things on fire. So <laughs> you do it when it's moist during the rainy season if you have one. We don't have a rainy season. <laughs> and you want to watch that dry mulch too. So maybe cross maybe, that out. Yeah. 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 <laughs> okay, the biological controls were yes. my favorite types of control. Um, and so the biological control, we're using one species of organism to reduce the population of pest organisms. So these are living natural enemies um, that are controlling pests in our garden. Um, and there's all, all kinds of pests have natural enemies. Um, we're most familiar with it with uh, insect natural enemies. Here we have a, a leaf, uh, an assassin bug feeding on a leaf hopper. See, it's, it's got those sucking mouth parts and it's got those big front legs and that's what we call an assassin bug because they're very dramatic and they're fairly large. And they'll pull that leaf hopper out of the sky, bring it down, Jab it with their proboscis, <laughs> suck out the juices, and oh kill that leaf. Is that on YouTube? That's an assassin. <laughs> is that on YouTube? We don't have we don't have a picture of the assassin, but, but we have some nice pictures on the YouTube channel of lady beetles and I think lace wings eating uh, insects. So so those are fun to watch. <laughs> and here we have uh, uh, this is a little parasitic wasp trick of grandma wasp laying its egg inside the egg of a caterpillar, a really tiny little oh wasp. And so that killed the larvae inside will kill the egg. And then this is a weevil that's feeding on star thistle, which is a, a, a noxious weed in rangelands. Uh, so this is a biological control of weeds. So we all kinds of organisms, whether they're weeds or insects, and you talked about the decolate snail uh, earlier this morning as a natural enemy of the brown garden snail. Um, but uh, pathogens and nematodes all have natural enemies too. So biological control is sort of the science of how we use these uh, organisms. Uh, and we know most, most of what we have the most information about insect pests. And so, and also I'm going to emulge, so we'll be just talking about insect pests in this little brief uh, moment on biological control I have here. But there are, remember that, especially in nature, you've got a lot of this going on um, in nature. So when you think about plant pathogens, and uh, uh, there are, for every plant pathogen, there's other competitive kinds of microorganisms 
that can reduce their numbers or suppress them, sometimes killing them, sometimes just out-competing them, and they can be very important. And that's the reason why you hear people talking about soil health. Because if you, uh, if you have a healthy soil, that means you have a, a diversity of microorganisms and also invertebrates in the soil moving around, and you, so you've got a very complex e ecosystem, a complex food web. And when you have a complex food web like that, um, it's less likely that a serious plant pathogen species is going to be able to predominate. And so when you um, fumigate your soil or uh, use a lot of pesticides, um, uh, those and, and sometimes even when you cultivate or deep rototill a whole lot, you can disturb that soil health. And having the organic matter in there is important. And so you may, we may not have very many specific recommendations about how to reduce uh, soil pathogens, for instance, but um, that is uh, just maintaining good soil health is important. <coughs> this book, The Natural Enemies Handbook, and this, you'll have this in your Master Gardener's uh, uh, library there, it's got lots of information if you're interested in biological control, not only in insect natural enemies, but also on natural enemies of um, weeds and and pathogens, so you can take a look at that. It's got lots of nice pictures. So in terms of insect natural enemies, and I'm just going to briefly go through, is um, uh, there's three groups, general groups of natural enemies that uh, attack and kill insects and are important uh, in biological control. So we've got predators. Those are the little hunters in the system. Everybody's familiar with lady beetles and how they will hunt down aphids and feed them both in their adult and larval stages. Many predators out there, you're familiar with lacewings and praying mantids and spiders and uh, many, many other insects. <coughs> Uh, so people are sort of aware of these, although they have no idea of the diversity of uh, natural predators out in the system. They, they're familiar with this very colorful lady beetle and maybe a couple other things. Parasites, so many people don't know about parasites, sometimes called parasitoids. These are little wasps, also a few species of little flies, that lay their eggs inside or on top of pest insects and then when they hatch out, they eat out the inside of the in insect and kill it. So um, they lay many eggs, and so they can be very uh, effective in reducing population numbers. So these are called parasites or parasitoids. And then also, insects are attacked by various kinds of pathogens. <coughs> They're attacked by uh, fungi and bacteria and viruses and protozoans. And these naturally out there in your garden you will see sick insects, um, and uh, often they have been killed by pathogens. Uh, we have a few pathogens that are for sale as pesticides, Bacillus thuringiensis, which is used in uh, Kirkstocki, which is used against caterpillar pests, and uh, Bacillus thuringiensis israelizensis, which is used against mosquitoes and fungus gnats, are available. But most of the pathogens that we rely on are ones that are uh, occurring there naturally in the environment. So let's look at these parasites, uh, more properly called parasitoids, because they're not parasitic in their whole life. They're paras parasitic uh, in their immature stages, but not their adult life. So here we have the the adult <coughs> adult lays the eggs inside the aphid here, for instance. It hatches into this is the larvae of the uh, wasp. Um, eats out and kills the aphid very fairly rapidly within a couple of days. Um, the aphid, in the case of the aphid, gets sort of a its skin, it dies, and its skin forms this crusty, what we call mummy, and, it pu and the wasp pupates inside, and then when it's ready to emerge, it's because it's got complete metamorphosis with adult larvae, pupa, and then adult, when it's ready to emerge, it cuts a hole in the dead skin of the aphid and emerges as an adult, and, mates and then lays eggs and, and other aphids. In the case of these aphid parasites, this life cycle is, depending on temperature, you know, maybe a week or ten days. So they can build up their populations quite rapidly. And you'll see aphid mummies often around on uh, aphids in your garden if you look for them. 
Uh, many species of, uh, of, well, virtually every insect has at least one species of parasite that attacks it. Um, and, uh, and most of these parasites are very specific, so they only attack one or a few closely uh, related species. So these aphid parasites won't attack caterpillars, but there's caterpillar parasites, and there's leafhopper parasites, and there's beetle parasites. So they're out there. Sometimes they will just wipe out 80 or 90 percent of the population, but sometimes they only take you know, 10, 30 percent. Depends on the parasite and the situation. So here we have a, a parasite called Hypersoda exigera, which uh, attacks uh, caterpillars in the garden. Uh, and so here she is, she's laying her egg inside an army worm here with her stinger. So, you know, that's one of the things, I gotta do my little stinger talk. We are very, you know, anthropocentric, we're, we're, we're very oriented to ourselves and we think that the stingers were, stingers and wasps were invented to sting us, people. <laughs> but the fact is that a very few wasps have the ability to sting people. Just a few, like the yellow jacket, have that ability. But the stinger is what it really is. It's an egg-laying device. And only females have it. And, uh, and most of the, and of course, these little wasps are very tiny. You can hardly see them. And these, most of these wasps, most wasps use their, their stingers or ovipositors responsibly, which means <laughs> laying eggs in other insects. And of course, those oak galls, those are uh, the, caused by little wasps which lay their eggs inside the, the oak galls, and they're using their, their uh, stingers responsibly, too. <laughs> so here we have, there she's stinging the caterpillar. Uh, this is, we've, we've pulled, the, um, pulled the caterpillar apart so you can see this. Uh, this is the larvae of the wasps inside the caterpillar. Sometimes we tell burrs to go through their alfalfa fields and pop their caterpillars to see whether they have um, uh, larvae. But an easier way to see them is once once the, the, the caterpillar is killed, this is uh, dried up skin of the unfortunate caterpillar, and connected to it is this fluffy cocoon. This is the cocoon of the wasp, which has killed it. So with the parasites, you don't see the little wasps very much because they're so small, they don't live very long. Um, and uh, uh, and they're just you just don't see them. What you see is weird things happening to your pests out in the field. And so, once you, when you see weird things, you know, bring it back, take it, look it up. We've tried to include in the various books and pest notes pictures of the common parasites or what parasite parasitized uh, insect might look. Uh, so look like so to keep your eye out for things like that. Holes and aphids, dead aphids are holes in scales. They're exit holes uh, where little wasps have emerged. Uh, sometimes you'll see those also in, in some caterpillar species. So uh, keep a look out for those. Okay, so we're going to rather rapidly go through some of the insects that are predators. General predators are insects that will feed on a lot of variety of different. Um, uh, insects, so they're useful in the environment, although they may not focus on and completely wipe out the population. So we saw the assassin bug already. Uh, the, we have a lot of these uh, predatory ground beetles uh, that feed on soil invertebrates, so they'll be feeding on pupae of caterpillars in the soil or um, uh, cutworms, uh, insects in the soil. We've got the lacewing. This is a very common insect uh, predator. Uh, and the lacewing uh, feeds on aphids, but also feeds on lots of other soft-bodied insects, including its brothers and sisters. There's a whole lot of uh, predatory bugs, and I think you're going to have an insect, um, you're going to have an entomology section uh, at class at some point, so you'll learn about these insect classifications. But one big group is called uh, what we call the true bugs, and that's the Heteroptera, which is part of the Hemiptera group. Uh, and these are called um, sort of half wings. They, they all have this little sort of triangle in there where their, their wings cross. And so and these are insects, the sassy bug is one. Stink bugs, squash bugs, which are pests, uh, are also, um, but many of these 
are beneficial insects that feed in your garden, and you're not going to. Um, uh, I and and they're often hard to distinguish from pests. Um, lady beetles are lady beetles direct their uh, feeding behavior to specific pests. Uh, and that's one reason why I like lady beetles in particular. Now, the red and black lady beetles, like the Cypidomia con convergent lady beetle, feed most all, all, mostly on aphids. So if you have an aphid problem, they'll really focus on that, and they won't be feeding on caterpillars or other kinds of things. But if caterpillars are the problem, the lady beetles won't do much because they're not interested. <laughs> so you know the adult lady beetle, the larvae of the lady beetle, a lot of people don't recognize that as being the immature stage of the lady beetle. But the larvae is very important because it feeds on aphids too and it doesn't fly away. So if you see these in your garden you're, and you got aphids, then you should be very happy. And then of course the larvae uh, forms a pupa uh, before becoming the adult. This is what the pupa looks like. And these are eggs of lady beetles. Good idea to be able to identify the eggs of various uh, pests out there in your garden so you know what's going to come eggs of pets or eggs of lady beetles, you wouldn't want to destroy these if you saw them, but if you saw stink bug eggs, you'd want to destroy them. <coughs> Here's uh, very quickly, just there's many other uh, red and black lady beetles. There's actually, in your quick tips, there's a lady beetle pest card. These again all feed mostly on aphids, um, but there's uh, other groups of lady beetles that feed on um, Specialize on other kinds of insects like the mealybug destroyer on mealybugs, spider mite destroyer on spider mites, twice stub lady beetle on scales, and the Vendalia beetle on cotton cushion scale. One thing about lady beetles are they're, they're sort of convex and round, and they have very short antennae. You can hardly see them. A lot of people confuse the spotted cucumber beetle with the lady beetles, but the spotted cucumber beetle has long antennae. The spotted cucumber beetle is a pest and it eats holes in, in certain vegetables, so you don't want to confuse them. It's also a little greener. People are very interested in how to use biological control or <coughs> and they want to use it in their gardens. Uh, how do you use it? Uh, Many people say, well, what can I purchase to control my earwigs, or what can I purchase to control my conley moth? And um, there really aren't biological control or living natural enemies that you can buy for most pests to release. Lady beetles are uh, one, nematodes for lawn grubs are another, but very few. Mostly you're going to be uh, relying on the naturally occurring biological control, so you want to begin to recognize the ones in your garden. It's interesting to know about the idea of classical biological control, which involves importing exotic species. This is not something you as a citizen does, but it is being done by the university and by the uh, uh, State Department of Food and Agriculture and uh, the USDA. Um, but most of our plants that we cultivate, particularly our edible plants, do not are not native from California. They're native many times from Asia or Europe or uh, Australia or uh, anywhere but here, Africa. Uh, and so these plants came over, and for a while there might have been a honeymoon phase or there weren't pests, but the pests seemed to come over too. What doesn't come over easily is the natural enemies, the little parasites and predators that control that pest back home, where there's often a much better balance of nature. And the idea be, be, behind classical biological control is trying to recreate that balance. So that's something there's specialists in. At UC Riverside, for instance, Mark Hoddle, who's very involved in going abroad and trying to find natural enemies from the home of origin of some of the newer pests we have here and bringing them back. And sometimes you can establish, we have been able, with more than 120 different cases in California, been able to actually import natural enemies, release them, and, and reduce pests quite significantly. Of course, it has to be done very carefully and it has to be done through quarantine procedures by people who have special permits because you do not want to be bringing in insects from abroad because they might, um, you know, they might parasitize honeybees or butterflies or insects that people uh, like. So it's a very careful, carefully regulated process. 
uh, very quickly, here's, a, here's an example of one. This is the, the ash whitefly, and it came here in the early 1990s, either probably into LA. Um, it looks like this is a whitefly. Whiteflies are very small. Um, the adult looks very similar to other whitefly species, but the, the immature nymphs are quite different because they have this waxy white, um, the droplets on them. And they, were, they, they hit them hit the ash trees particularly they also on citrus and toyon and not so bad. You can see there's they're they're sucking insects like aphids so they produce a lot of honeydew. You can see it dropped on the ground here and, and sooty mold grows over that honeydew. It was really hard on the trees. And so it was it was a major problem. Is that is that ten minutes? Yeah. Let's see how far we get. Uh, and so uh, some scientists from UC Riverside uh, uh, work, started working on this problem and they found that this white fly um, had come over from the Mediterranean region and they went to Israel and they found, lo and behold, the ash white fly in very low numbers, but it, because it was being controlled by a little wasp, this little incarcian era, see laying its egg there, and this little lady beetle. Um, a little brownish lady beetle, Cladostethus, and they brought it in, put it through all the quarantine procedures, discovered these things only fed on white flies, and very specifically that white fly for the parasite. They reared them up and they released them just in a few places in California because the, the white fly <coughs> spread all the way up and down California and was just wreaking havoc with uh, ash trees. And they spread naturally. And now we, we never see that white fly in the trees. I go and collect on Toyon, um, and I do see the white fly, but it's just a few of them here and there, and you usually see some evidence of these parasites there. So it's biological control in action. It doesn't work for everything, but when it works, it's, it's really a, a wonderful thing. But in terms of what you do in your garden, you're going to be focusing on enhancing natural biological control. One of the ways of doing that is providing water, nectar, shelter, alternative food sources. These little parasitic wasps will live longer and lay more eggs if they have water and nectar. They don't feed, most of them do not feed on the, ins, uh, the insects. They, they just can take in nectar and water uh, as a food source. Um, uh, controlling ants, as I mentioned before, ants protect honeydew producing insects up in trees and other plants. So sometimes you'll see a whole line of ants crawling up a tree and they're not up there looking at the view. They're up there <laughs> looking for some food. And what food could be up there? Well, there could be sap from some kind of damage to the tree. There could be ripening fruit. Or there could be a honeydew producing insect. So these honeydew producing insects like aphids, white flies, mealybugs, um, uh, soft scales, um, they have the sucky mouth parts, they take in a lot of sap and they have to concentrate it to get enough protein and so they put out a lot of that sticky honeydew and the, the, the um, ants collect the honeydew and then walk down the tree with the honeydew and, and um, uh, feed their colony. But when they're up there, they're also kicking off parasites and, and predators that are trying to feed on the the uh, aphids and they very effectively protect them from uh, natural enemies and if you can keep the ants out of the tree then the biological control um, uh, may go on and we did research with this with the citricola uh, scale on uh, 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 hackberry trees in, uh, in Davis where we uh, put sticky uh, tanglefoot around the trees, uh, some of the trees kept the ants out and we got incredible parasitization and the scales went away. On other trees where they weren't kept out, the, the problem was very severe. The tricky thing is that we don't have really good ways of keeping them out of the trees. Tanglefoot does work, but it's kind of sticky stuff to, to work with. But the most important way is to avoid using pesticides that kill natural enemies. Because the pesticides that we use, especially insecticides, usually much more toxic to the beneficials than they are, and also to honeybees, than they are to the pests. And they often leave residues that stay on plants for quite a while, maybe 
uh, several weeks or even months in some cases that will kill natural enemies that are coming off. Coming off. And that's why in, in integrated pest management programs we try to rely, if we have to use pesticides, we try to use the pesticides that are least toxic to natural enemies, like these uh, bacterial diseases of caterpillars, the Bacillus thuringiensis, insecticidal oils and soaps, these are the least toxic to natural enemies and are the first choice if they are effective against the particular pest that you have a problem with. Next in line would be the pyrethrum, which is a bot botanical, which is a product of the, of the um, chrysanthemum daisy, spinosad, um, which is also a, another microbial. These are a little more toxic, but they're shorter lived, and so they have uh, less uh, impact on natural ones. These are highly toxic, and we try to not use these in our IPM programs, the pyrethroids, uh, seven or carbaryl, organophosphate, or imidacloprid, which is that systemic insect. And I'm not going to talk about insecticides uh, in the afternoon, so I'm not going to go through much in detail of these. So, in the home landscape, the takeaway message is lots of people have very nice gardens and never use pesticides at all. <coughs> um, but um, other people do use pesticides, want to use pesticides, have reason to use pesticides. There are uh, certain uh, plants uh, and vegetables that you may not be able to control, uh, you may not be able to successfully grow without uh, using pesticides, things like you get peach leaf curling peaches, you really have to treat for that if you want to grow peaches successfully. Um, but the thing to remember is that pesticides range in toxicity. So some of the pesticides like the soaps and oils and, and the bacillus thuringiensis, really they don't have a toxic impact on the environment. So they're, you know, they, they really are very benign and, and, and yet others are much more toxic and so you need to be able to know which are which. Um, we don't understand all the potential impacts of pesticides. One thing I learned over my 35 years was that you know, pesticides would be identified as having serious environmental or health problems and then they'd roll in a new product. This one's completely safe. And then 10 years later they'd find, uh-oh, uh, some problem with that and then they bring in another pesticide. The problems seem to crop up in, in time. So, you, the take home message there is you don't want to use them if you don't really need to use them because you never know. And pesticide questions are some of the hardest for master gardeners to answer. They're hard for me to answer because these products change all the time and our knowledge about them changes all the time. And so you really, that's why we ask that as master gardeners you don't try to do the research yourself on Google but that you use the university resources and give people pest notes or uh, other university resource, University of California resources on pesticides because you don't want to get it wrong. California has stiffer regulations than other states, so if you're getting information from Arizona, that might not be appropriate for California. So we rely on the written University of California publications. So in general, IPM uh, is less risk to the environment and health an emphasis on prevention. You should have fewer pest problems because you're working there on the ecosystem. And the steps are identify the pest and then figure out whether it really is a problem. Uh, think about the ecosystem, how it works in the ecosystem. Um, identify conditions in your garden or landscape that favor the pest and then change those. Do a little habitat management if possible. And that will be prevention. And if you need to use pesticides, use the least toxic uh, control methods. And you can find out about those on the website or in the publications here. I can see my time is up. I thought you were the There'll be a second show at 12.30. <laughs> <laughs>